we are moving along really well. So we've already covered everything uh, from chapters one through five that I was hoping to have done. And seeing as how we're only in week five, so we're ahead of the curve. So obviously we don't have to keep driving along fast if obviously we might have some issues with people attending, but obviously we're recorded anyway. So I'll kind of start off with, do you guys have any questions for me about anything we've covered so far? The lab, uh, both four and five this week, I've kicked them both back. So they're due next Friday already, along with the, uh, the homework and the quiz for this week, just in case anybody's having issues with internet connections. So, you know, yeah, that stuff will be due, but it's due later. So for now, just focus on making sure that you guys get all of your stuff in that you guys, you know, normally do stay on top of things, but just know you got a little bit more time with things just so, you know, everybody's going to be okay. Um, given our wonderful weather that we're having right now. Um, outside of that, um, yeah, you guys have been turning in your take home assignments. Really think through each of those prompts on the questions. Really think through kind of what am I asking? And when I say, when I'm talking about limits, I'm not asking for how the systems work. That, that's the given. That's something that we don't even need to waste time on. Instead, explain to me why we think they work the way they work. What's the cause that they can only move at those speeds? So that's something to make sure when you guys are digging down, you're digging in the right direction. So the limits to how energy systems work or how fast they can work, saying that, yeah, we use these enzymes to make these things happen, like that's cool and all, but instead, why do those enzymes only work at those speeds? Why can't we go faster? Why can't we shorten up those enzymatic cascades? So instead of glycolysis being 12 steps, it's three or four. Why can't we do these things in effectively more rapid succession? Those are the questions that go into, and you're getting into limits of chemistry, physics, and biology. Like it just literally can't go any faster. So that's the basic idea of like, why can we only go? So why can a human being only run at certain speeds? Well, it turns out we're shitty athletes. Our fiber types typically aren't gonna allow us to go that quickly. We've got muscles that can only contract at a certain velocity. So that's a limitation right then and there. Then we've got muscle attachments and then the length of those limbs that are going to limit how fast our joints can move around those rotation. We're going to have issues with being able to produce force in a very short period of time and so on and so forth. Really thinking through what are the limits to why things work the way that they do. So that's something to really try to drive down into and get a better concept of effectively what's going on. Now, if there aren't any questions, we'll go ahead and lecture a little bit. Obviously, lab on Friday is probably not going to happen with the joys of this weather. Uh, if we're able to go on campus by Friday, then we'll have lab in person doing the normal thing, but don't risk yourself guys, just do your best to get out there, make sure you're staying safe. And otherwise I will plan on not seeing you guys in person until the following Friday. So we'll kind of try to leave the lab open during next week so you can come in and do the vertical jump lab at your own time. Obviously the idea is you go to a gym and do the reps to failure at different percentages and then enter in your data and I'll try to make a Google Doc that you can just kind of enter in your information uh, accordingly. Remember, you're going to do at least one set of 100% of your max for one rep, and then you'll write in the true percentage. So say your max is 200 pounds. Well, you could do a true 80% of 200 pounds because that's 160. But if your max is 205, your true 80% max of 205 is instead of being 160, it's going to be 164. So you put 165 on there, which is not 80%. It's more like closer to 81%. So you're right, you did 81% for that number of reps. That's when we're talking about breaking down the data. Make sure you do it correctly. And then we get into the body comp lab, which, you know, kind of the same thing. If you guys want to partner up, you feel comfortable working with somebody, we can go ahead and figure out a situation so you guys can come in and do that testing on one another. There's walkthroughs online of how you're going to go through all of the sites and make sure you're hitting each of them twice. 
we're only going to have you go through each site twice with your partner. We're not going to worry about folks doing it with more people, but at least then you guys are going to get a chance to go through and do that sampling. Hopefully be able to hop on the DEXA or do the BOD pod, at least the BIS systems, as long as myself or uh, my GA happens to be in the lab. So with all that being said, let's go ahead and talk a little bit about our wonderful cardiovascular system. So a cardiovascular system is all about effectively moving things around the body. So this is what's gonna give us oxygen, carbohydrates, protein, fats, all of our vitamins and minerals. It's gonna remove carbon dioxide, ammonia, and those wonderful protons we're pumping out when we're using a lot of anaerobic metabolism. It's gonna be how we transport our hormones, our, a lot of our immune cells and other signaling molecules throughout our body. It's gonna be how we're gonna help maintain not just our temperature, but also to maintain fluid and electrolyte levels along with acting to buffer so we keep our pH within a certain range, not too basic and not too acidic. And then obviously, once again, that's how our immune system is moving around. So our cardiovascular system is gonna come down to three different systems. Um, so question of if we're not gonna do in-person live, do you want us to still meet on Zoom on Friday? No, you guys enjoy the day, okay? We'll, you know, the labs, we still need to have you guys have that data. I'm not gonna punish you guys with us having to talk through things. We're working ahead in the lecture. If you guys want, I'll plan on just kind of having an open Q and A at 125 that you can ask me questions about any of the different assignments in the course, um, labs, et cetera, just information kind of for the good of the order. If there's anything like that that you guys wanna go through, great, let's do it. But otherwise, no. enjoy your Friday. If you're frozen in, it, chill out on your, uh, on your couch, sofa, futon, et cetera, with a blanket on and try not to freeze out there because it is, it's invigorating. My mustache literally froze last night when I was walking the dog. It was awesome. So our cardiovascular system is made up of three different elements. The pump, which is our heart, the pipes, which is our blood vessels, and then the fluid, which is blood. Okay, that's it. Those are the three different components. Now, each of those three components is obviously incredibly necessary and useful. And each of them is going to have a certain amount of adaptability. It's going to have its own specific timeline for that adaptability and its capacity to improve or change. So yes, our heart is going to develop the tension needs to eject blood from the left ventricle into the aorta, which then is gonna go through the rest of the body until it comes back and get pumped out again. And we're going to pump as much blood to the tissues as they need to maintain themselves and have as much blood flow effectively to keep up their basic demands. So the heart and anatomy of it should be something that's easily reviewed. You guys have seen this before. We've got our right and left atria. We've got our right and left ventricle. Left ventricle is what pumps it to the body. Right ventricle is what pumps it to the lungs. Atria is when it's returning. Right atria is from the body. Left ventricle or left atria is from our lungs. Now we have our pericardium and that happens to be effectively where we are going to have a bit of a fascial layer. We've got the cavity which is going to be effectively the occupying inside. And then obviously the wonderful fluid that's gonna exist. You don't wanna to have too much fluid in your pericardial sac because that can cause your heart to collapse and not work. Hooray. So the, I'm not gonna ever really ask you guys a lot of questions about the different valves. They're obviously are important specifically that our blood is moving one way throughout our heart. If you have an issue with the valve that doesn't close or fully, you're gonna have an inefficiency of your heart. Your heart's gonna be obviously underperforming. And obviously if you have a valve below, especially if it's your aortic valve, you're probably gonna be pushing up the daisies because it turns out you're not really getting blood anywhere else throughout the rest of the body like you need to. So it's a flow chart. I believe in you guys. We then have what's those a myocardium. That's where we actually have our muscle. Now, the left ventricle happens to have the most of it because this is where we have to have enough force to pump blood, not just 
out of the ventricle, but literally eject it so it goes around the rest of the body and the highest blood pressure you have is gonna be in your aorta after we talk about your left ventricle when it's contracting. So because of this, we're going to find that when you're in good shape, you're going to increase the size of the chamber of your heart along with increasing the thickness of the myocardium so it can pump that blood with more force. And in disease states, you're going to typically see that you can either have an increasing in the size of the myocardium, but not an increasing the size of the chamber because it's got greater pressure to go against and other situations where it's going to increase in size, but the muscle doesn't get stronger. And that's more uh, cardiovascular failure. So yes, you do get adaptions from exercise and disease, but those mechanisms and the efficiencies are massively different. Now, the cardiac muscle fiber we have, guys, is all type one, really high capillary density, really high numbers of mitochondria, and it's striated just like your normal skeletal muscle. Now, there's a number of different special properties aside from it's all type one, okay? The first is that our cardiac muscles have what's known as intercalated discs. This is going to, through the desmosomes, which are going to literally hold two different myocardium cells together, allow through those gap junctions, one myocardium cell to cause the next myocardium cell to depolarize. So that's why when your heart contracts, all of your atria contracts, then all of your ventric ventricles or all the mus myocardium of your ventricles contract. You can't just get a twitch like you can get everywhere else in the rest of your body. You get a full contraction and a full relaxation. And that's also down due to some uh, plateau potential effects we get from calcium. And also we have the pacemaker potential, which is caused from leaky channels in a couple different locations. So the basics of how we're seeing the differences between our skeletal muscle and our myocardium, okay? So with myocardium, we don't have multinucleation. We are going to have involuntary contractions, which hopefully are gonna be rhythmic, and we are going to have a calcium-induced calcium release. So calcium is actually involved in it, sorry to go back here, guys, where we can actually see how we have these calcium demands going. And this is uh, the, uh, the DHP and ryanodine receptors where they're going to be unlinked, which is different than what we're gonna find from our normal skeletal muscle. So another happy little flow chart as far as what's going on with the differences between the two. You're gonna see that branching essentially pattern here with a cardiac muscle fiber that we don't have with a skeletal muscle. And this is good because it turns out we don't want our heart to leak along with it's going to cause it to, when it does contract, eject blood because it's moving in a number of acute angles. So the heart itself obviously needs its own blood supply. We've got the right coronary artery, which supplies the right side, the left coronary artery, which supplies blood to the left side. And then we can have, you can see these little inner linkages. This is what's known as anastomosis, where we have a junctioning of the vessels. Really, really in-shape people have got more and more of those along with increased amounts of arterial blood flow and otherwise to the heart itself. So you're actually gonna be less likely to have things like a myocardial inf infarction. Now, atherosclerosis, you guys have probably heard of before. This is going to be that type of coronary artery disease where we're going to slowly get blockages to develop over time thanks to plaque buildup, which is gonna be effectively due to inflammation that's gonna be, the plaque is mostly cholesterol based with a little bit of calcium as well. So now when we say that the heart has what's known as spontaneous rhythmicity, this means that literally it causes itself to contract without any neurological drive, not like the acetylcholine release we get from our motor units to get those individual muscle fibers to contract. Now, this is because of what's known as pacemaker potentials because of leaky channels. And this in turn is gonna cause the heart to have its own baseline rhythm. Now, we've got the SA node, which is going to be the part that typically is going to control the entire signaling cascade for the rest of the heart. Now, it has its own pacemaker potential. The, R, the atrias have their own pacemaker potential. The AV node has its own pacemaker potential, as does the bundle and the Purkinje fibers. So if one fails, we simply drop to the next one, and that's going to give us a slower resting heart rate each time until finally it'll be left with the ventricular uh, fibers and that'll be super slow. And if you're to that point, things are, things are going bad. Now, 
this electrical signal is going to spread via what's known as gap junctions. Remember how we're going to go and it's going to, from the SA node, de SA node depolarizing, spread throughout the atria until it gets to the AV node, from the AV node through the AV bundle, also as the bundle has, down the bundle branches, down the Purkinje fibers, and into the ventricles. You'll see an image of this in, in a bit. This should all be reviewed. Now, if our heart has absolutely no innervation from our vagal nerve, we're going to have a resting heart rate of about 100 beats per minute. Now, this is typically lower because we've got parasympathetic tone, we're relaxed. Now, at the same time, if we dump in some epinephrine, we're going to see that heart rate really start to increase because now we're leaking faster from those leaky channels. So we're going to depolarize more frequently. So because of that, we're going to have a faster heart rate as opposed to if we have a lot of parasympathetic tone and very little amounts of epinephrine, norepinephrine in the bloodstream, the heart's going to slow down a lot more. So what I just spoke through before, we've got that SA node where we get that initial depolarization. These are what's known as the Bachman bundle. It's going to be a little bit neurological. That's going to allow the signals to go faster through your atria. Now from there, it's going to go to the AV node, which gives us a nice little delay. So these muscles are contracting while this signal is going through until it finally proliferates down the AV bundle, down the bundle branches, down the Purkinje fibers, and then into the myocardium of the actual, uh, <coughs> excuse me, of the ventricles, which in turn is going to give us contraction, which is good because if your heart doesn't beat, you're typically dead. Uh, it's very rare that you wouldn't be. And that's because you have a machine that's hooked up to you that's pumping blood around you otherwise. So briefly what I brought up before, the reality of how our heart rate is going to change based upon are we under vagal tone? Are we under sympathetic tone? Which in turn is going to cause the speed of that SA node to depolarize to be faster. And then from there, once we get that depolarization, boom, we're gonna work our way all the way down. Now, resting heart rate is a pretty good indicator of overall uh, fitness, and you could kind of even say health. So if you've got a resting heart rate that's literally in the 40s or below, you're in really good aerobic condition. Your body is super relaxed when you're not exercising, which is good sign. What it means is very little effort for your body to keep your body going. Now, keep in mind with the effects of that 10th cranial nerve, our vagal nerve, we're going to slow down that heart rate. Whereas once again, we drop in that epinephrine, that norepinephrine in turn, we're going to get that depolarization to happen faster and because of this, we're gonna increase our heart rate, but also it's gonna increase the force of contraction. So from there, in turn, we're going to be able to effectively get our body ready to go at a faster and a higher rate. Now, like anything else, our heart rate is gonna have a true max. So notice that 250 beats per minute, eh, you probably might not be able to go that fast. Uh, actually, most people shouldn't. Uh, rodents have like resting heart rates in the two to 300 beats per minute because like anything else, the bigger your heart is, the more time it takes for it to refill and depolarize before it can contract even when going maximally. And so that's why like something like a blue whale probably has like a maximal heart rate of, I wouldn't even imagine like hundred beats per minute simply because it's got so much tissue and so much blood it has to pump per beat to go around its body. Now, if we were to go ahead and look at all these electrical signals of different parts depolarizing, it would give us what's known as an ECG, also an EKG. Now, this is effectively looking at the conduction as it's going through the heart. So when we're getting a depolarization of big amounts of tissue, so the P wave itself is going to be just the atria's depolarizing. The QRS complex is going to be the ventricles depolarizing. And then the T wave is going to be just the ventricles repolarizing. Notice you do not see the AV node, the SA node, the bundle of his, the bundle branches, et cetera, depolarizing because they are small amounts of tissue compared to look at how much muscle you have in your ventricles compared to how much muscle you have in your atrias. So once the atria get done depolarizing, during what's known as a PDAR interview, this is where the AV node is depolarizing. It's going through the AV bundles, through the bundle branches, and then through the Purkinje fibers, and then boom, we have hit those muscle fibers of our ventricle. And also during this time, this is where our atria is repolarizing. You just can't see it because they're so small. And then we're going to have a little another baseline and then repolarization. 
This is normal, going from A to B, how the body's gonna move through it. Now, there are going to be a number of different situations you can find yourself in. Bradycardia is going to be a very low resting heart rate. Pathological, because once again, we have heart failure, that's by a, now if this is because you're in good shape, you're a healthy individual, that's absolutely fine, that's normal. Tachycardia, high resting heart rate. This is going to be high because you're exercising, normal. If it's high because you're standing there, not good, not good. There's something that's either really stressing you out or some type of system in your body that's not working like it should. Premature ventricular contraction is where you might feel like your heart skipped a beat. This is something that does happen. Uh, it's going to be something that happens a little bit more uh, frequently in some folks. If it happens very frequently, then you need to go get checked out because it could lead to uh, ventricle fibrillation, which we'll get to in a little bit. Atrial flutter or fibrillation is where your atria is going to depolarize super rapidly. Atrial flutter, it's going to be going fast, but your ventricles are going to be slower rate. It's uncomfortable. You probably feel something wrong with your chest. Go get checked out. Atrial, uh, atrial fib is just where it's firing just sporadically and wildly, but your ventricles is where it matters and you're fine. Ventral tachycardia, that's where your heart rate's taking off. For some reason, it's depolarizing faster than it should. And then finally, ventricular fib, and that's where your vent uh, ventricles are depolarizing in a disorganized manner. This is where you use an AED on somebody because if you're a ventricle fib, you're not conscious because you're not pumping any blood to your brain. And so you're going to pass out. So what we've talked through between the way that blood flows through the heart, it's going to be pumped out along with the electrical conduction going to the heart gives us what's known as a cardiac cycle. So when the heart is not beating, this is what's known as diastole. And this is where our ventricles and our atria are going to be filling with blood. This is two thirds of the time. One third of the time is going to be what's known as systole. This is where our heart's actually contracting. And this leads us to what is known as the Wiggers diagram. If you understand this diagram, excuse me, folks, you understand how the heart works as it's going through its different stages. So effectively, as we're looking from left to right, what you're going to see is, a, is going to be the time. Now, as we're looking from top to bottom, we've got pressure in millimeters mercury, we've got volume in green, in yellow, we've got essentially millivoltage, and then in orange, we have sound. So you see how you get the depolarization at the atria, which is where we get the atria kicks, we get a top off of volume, we can see the pressure go up a little bit, but notice we then have the QRS complex. This is where the ventricles depolarize. Notice no blood's leaving the heart, but we see this pressure cranking up because the ventricles are contracting. Now, once we reach this point, that's when we're gonna have the opening of the aortic valve. Blood is now leaving the heart, and we can see how this uh, volume is coming down. We then get repolarization, so now the force is gonna come down until it eventually crosses over, the aortic valve closes, we're going to then go ahead and come all the way back down to baseline. So now the, the pressure in the ventricle is lower than it happens to be in the atria. And once again, we see the blood flow uh, center, the blood filling the heart, and then we're ready to go again until we have our next P wave, which gives us that atrial kick of volume and so on and so forth. So just notice if your atria don't work effectively, you lose about one third of your heart's, heart's efficiency. If your ventricles don't work, you're dead. So, the joys of science. And this is just a little bit more of talking through what we went and just went through with the previous one. If you understand the Wiggers diagram, you understand how the heart works and what's going on as we go through one stage to the next. Now, stroke volume is the amount of blood that we're able to pump out with each beat. So a greater stroke volume means a greater amount of blood pumped out with each beat. Is this a good thing? Uh, the one that I was just showing you guys, that is known as the Wiggers diagram, W-I-G-G-E-R-S, Wiggers diagram. Now, ejection fraction is what percentage of total blood is the heart able to pump out with each beat. So what we want to see with an ejection fraction is a higher percentage, definitely over 50%. Anything, the lower we're getting there, effectively, the higher likelihood is that we're looking at not just an inefficient heart, but we're looking at probably diseased heart because it's able, it's not able to get a whole lot of its blood out. Most people resting, it's probably about 60 to 70%. That's normal, it's healthy. As you start to go up in exercise intensity, that's where we're gonna see ourselves doing a much better job of pumping all that blood out of the heart per each beat. Now, 
cardiac output happens to be the combination of the heart rate, so that's beats per minutes, multiplied by the stroke volume, blood per beat. So if we have how many times you your heart beat per minute, how much blood is pumping each beat, boom, we have the total liters of blood that your body is pumping around each minute. And this is a great indicator of how hard we're working out. So resting cardiac output for most people is around five liters. Obviously, if you're bigger or smaller, it'll scale appropriately. But as we get into exercise, our cardiac output's going up because now we're demanding more blood flow to our muscles because we need more oxygen to those areas and remove those metabolic byproducts. So we're going to want to see an increase in that cardiac output as we're going up further and further. Now, we then have our vascular system. This is going to be made up of those arteries right after the uh, aorta that are gonna be the big channels that have got a deal, that can deal with a high amount of pressure. Then we have our arterioles, which are gonna be smaller. And this is where we're gonna really control blood flow to capillaries by vasodilation or vasoconstriction, okay? Capillaries is where we're actually gonna have gas exchange, nutrient exchange, et cetera. This is where things are really getting taken care of. We then have venules, which is where we're gonna be collecting the blood to come back once we've gone through the capillaries and then our veins, and then finally getting ourselves to our vena cava. Veins being effectively the capacitance uh, system where most of the blood is sitting when you guys are happy to be at rest. And those are those things that stick out on your arms and otherwise. So blood pressure itself obviously is gonna be effectively how much pressure is sitting on the lines. So specifically we're looking at artery, arterial blood pressure, which is going to be on the systolic. So it's when their heart's contracting and the lower end, which is diastolic when our body happens to be at rest. Now mean arterial pressure is going to be the mathematical formula of two thirds of your diastolic blood pressure value and one third of your systolic blood pressure because it turns out your heart, remember guys, only spends about one third of its time contracted. So that's why when you're looking at blood pressure, diastolic blood pressure is more important than systolic blood pressure. They're both important, but one more so because it turns out that's the lowest pressure is ever gonna be. It's gonna be hanging out there all the time. Now, yes, you need blood flow to all of your tissues and your body is lazy. It's trying to give exactly how much blood flow you need to these areas, no more than is necessary because we're doing more work for no reason. It's inefficient. And it turns out that's a great way to starve to death if food's running low. So we're going to use pressure, meaning that high pressure from our ventricle and our aorta is going to then, as we go further and further, the pressure is going to go down. And like anything else, we go from high to low. So the bigger that pressure gradient, the further and harder we're going to be able to push that blood. Now, the other side from the pressure that we have is then going to be resistance. So that's effectively how hard is it for our body to pump that blood through. And that's going to be, notice the mathematical formula related to the length of the vessel, but also the radius. So if we have bigger vessels, it's much easier to send that blood. And so hence, when we vasodilate, it makes it easier to send blood to the air. When we vasoconstrict, because notice it's radius to the fourth power, it's going to really slow down blood to those areas. So the total amount of blood flow we have is gonna be related to the pressure change from one end to the other divided by the resistance. So hence the easiest way for us to change our blood flow is gonna come back to that vasoconstriction and vasodilation. So we're going to divert blood to where it's needed and away from where it's not. And that's where whenever you happen to be working out, your body's doing a better job of diverting it to your muscles. It's diverting it to your skin. If that's where you need it so you can thermoregulate and not overheat, it's gonna send it only where it's needed and not where it's not. And like anything else, those arterioles is where we're going to have that control of the radius. And thanks to vasoconstriction and vasodilation, we're going to see a huge amount of change in blood flow. So if we're to look at somebody at rest to someone at max exercise, okay? So when you happen to be at rest, Notice the percentages of your maximal blood flow. Most of it is going to be going to your digestive tract, to your kidneys. And then from there, we've got our muscles a little bit just because we happen to have a lot of them and our brain. Now, once we go into exercise, notice 
the vast majority of this blood flow, which is we're talking in this example of somebody playing tennis with pretty high intensity, 20 liters of blood per minute, as opposed to a rest, only 0.75 total liters of blood going to the muscles per minute. So this is notice just a five liters per minute at rest, whereas 25 total liters of blood during exercise. So certain areas of the body are going to get consistent amounts of blood flow. So whether we're exercising at max intensity or we're completely at rest, your brain is always getting about the exact same amount of blood flow, okay? Your heart itself, notice it's gonna take the exact same percentage because your heart needs to fuel itself. Everything else is negotiable. So we can have more or less blood flow to any of our tissues and not just, we're not saying all of your muscles are getting more blood flow, just the ones you happen to be utilizing in the exercise endeavor that you happen to be doing. Because once again, your body is simply trying to solve for the problem of, are we getting enough blood flow to the areas that need it? So any questions here on how we're getting blood flow to go and be shunted in certain directions through vasoconstriction and vasodilation, along with kind of the baselines of where we're at when we happen to not be exercising and then how it's going to escalate once we are at exercising to different areas. Okay. So once again, we're going to change this blood flow via what's known as vasoconstriction and vasodilation. The local tissues of those arterioles are going to be where we get this to occur. And this is going to de change depending on our need. Now there's going to be three different types of control, metabolic, endothelial, and myogenic. What does it mean? Metabolic is going to be mostly causing just vasodilation. And this is going to be because of lower oxygen levels, higher carbon dioxide, higher potassium, higher amounts of the wonderful proton that is hydrogen, so meaning our pH is lower, and lactate. On the other side, we have endothelial mechanisms, mostly going to be vasodilation, which are going to be due to nitric oxide, prostaglandins, and EDHF. Now, we're going to get vasoconstriction from what's from epinephrine. Now that's a global effect, meaning it's going to tell everywhere in the body that we need to vasoconstrict. It's these local mechanisms that will always override the effects of epinephrine. So that's a good thing because that means the local is going to vasodilate, whereas everywhere else is vasoconstricting. So boom, we're getting blood, uh, better blood flow. A great example of the global effects of really large amounts of epinephrine is if you ever saw somebody, saw somebody that got really, really scared or freaked out and they just turned sheet white, that's because they had vasoconstriction to the blood flow of their skin. And because of that, obviously, they're going to look very pallid because they've got less blood flow going to those areas. Now, we then have what's those myogenic me uh, mechanisms. That literally means as our muscle contracts, we're going to cause vasoconstriction in an area because of the pressure of the muscle contracting. And then when we relax, we're gonna have vasodilation allowing more blood flow to go to the area. This is natural part of the cycling of exercise. And this is good because it's actually gonna help with blood return to the heart. We talk about the one-way mechanisms of valves in our veins. However, it is something we said, if you're having to hold an isometric contraction, that's part of the reason why you gas out because literally you have enough vasoconstriction, you're not getting blood flow to those muscles, you're not getting blood flow to those muscles, you have to use anaerobic metabolism, you have to use anaerobic metabolism, you only got so long before you're gonna, you know, fall apart there. So, now that extrinsic control, this is where we're talking about our sympathetic nervous system, which is gonna cause vasoconstriction, and when we don't have a lot of sympathetic activity, vasodilation, and that's why the whole resting and digesting doesn't happen if you happen to be high on sympathetic tone because literally you're not able to send as much blood flow to your intestines to do so. Whereas when you're completely relaxed, you get really good vasodilation. So you're going to get good blood flow everywhere in the body. Now, when we're at rest, we're going to have 
most of our blood just sitting in our veins. This is good. There wasn't as capacitance vessels. They're naturally meant to be elastic. They can hold a lot of blood in there and that's going to be our reservoir, so to speak. Now it's as we go up higher and higher in exercise intensity, we're going to through that wonderful myogenic effect of the muscles contracting and relaxing, we're going to get better blood flow going back to the heart. And in turn, we're going to be able to eject faster and go a little bit more or you know, go at a little bit higher intensity. So how we're going to or control our blood pressure is going to be through what's known as baroreceptors. Now, baroreceptors are literally going to be what are sensitive to pressure effectively and from effectively rapid changes in blood pressure. This is why you can feel lightheaded if you stood up too fast, because these are trying to make sure that you're never sending too much blood pressure to sensitive organs like your brain, like your heart. And so it's going to constrict whenever we happen to do really high intensity resistance training where we have a new valve cell that's going to really jack our blood pressure through the roof. And then it's going to then, if it doesn't adapt fast enough because it won't release, we're going to effectively artificially choke ourselves out whenever that blood pressure comes back down rapidly. Go for it. Can you hear me? Dr. Lane, can you hear me? I guess the question I have is like, you're talking about um, like the blood flow and everything. What if a, like an athlete is training in like a high altitude, like, and you said about the heart beating fast and slow, like with them training in a high Let altitude. Another question whenever you're ready. I'm, oh, try it again. See if I can hear you now. Can you hear me now? Yeah, what's up, Sean? Okay, so <clears throat> when you were talking about like the heart, like speeding up and slowing down and everything um, with the athletes, what happens if like an athlete is training in like a high altitude? Like, would they try to lower their physical performance or would they try to up it? Like, how would they adjust in a high altitude Ooh, to make well, it? Yeah, no worries. Altitude is something we're going to cover later on. The big issue oh, okay. is because the partial pressure of oxygen is lower because air pressure is lower. You're getting uh -huh. less oxygen into your bloodstream on like a beat by beat. So naturally your cardiac output has to really go up just to have the same effective amount of oxygen delivery to your tissues. And so because of this, you're naturally going to be working harder just to exist. And that's why some folks will get um, altitude sickness and otherwise because their body is working really hard just to keep itself moving. And so in those situations, it's, it's technically more, more of a pulmonary issue that then lends itself into obviously becoming a cardiovascular issue. So it's not like the problem isn't being able to breathe enough. The problem is the air that you're getting in has not enough pressure to push itself, so to speak, into your bloodstream and because of that, your heart has to work harder, higher cardiac output at rest. So effectively, being in altitude naturally is kind of a rate limiter. Like you're not going to be able to work out as hard as you were previously because it turns out you're not able to metabolically uh, keep that up. So that like affects, well, how would that affect the blood flow? I guess I'm asking. Like, with Oh, the okay. Blood yeah, no, your, your blood flow sorry. is the absolute same. Okay, if, sorry. I have yeah, you're going to be, the key is you're going to be sending more blood around the body than you did previously. So it's just going to be, but it's going to be sending around in the same way it would have normally. It just has to send more of it. So one way to think of it would be like, think of being at altitude would be the equivalent of having to work out wearing like 80 pounds of clothes. Like, even if you're in really good shape, you're still not going to be able to do as many like push-ups and pull-ups and be able to run as fast. You're still going to be able to run, 
but if you're in really bad shape, you're barely going to be able to move. If you're in really good shape, you're still not going to be your best, but you're at least going to be able to do something. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Hey, no worries. Now let's have some fun talking about the joys of baroreceptors. So when you go and you do a heavy lift, in theory, and this is really bad technique, you're doing a Valsalva so you can go ahead and increase your blood pressure to keep your core tight. Now, as soon as you scream, you let go of all that air, and then you have that. Now, so if you were to look at this guy's blood pressure, it's normal, it's normal, it's normal, it's normal, it's up, it's up, it's up, it's way up. You can see how he's screaming, holding it. And then he lets go of it, and then his blood pressure goes down, and then it goes down lower, and you take a nap. That is the joys of baroreceptors, specifically when they don't happen to be helping you out at all. So, hmm. Yeah, let's, let's keep going. Let's keep going, guys. Now, remember when I said when our muscles are contracting, this in turn is going to cause pressure to be put on those veins, which in turn is going to push the blood up towards our heart because we're going to have that muscular contraction. And that's part of the reason why they tell you to, you know, to essentially get up and move around a little bit if you happen to be going on a really long flight or otherwise to avoid blood clotting because we get that advantage of that mechanical return because we have one-way valve, the muscles are going to help pumping, then also breathing in and breathing out. When you breathe in, you actually increase your blood pressure throughout your torso. When you breathe out, you lower your pressure throughout your torso. So that also helps kind of that milking to get the blood back where it needs to be. Now, finally, we have the fluid, and that's the blood itself. Most of your blood, okay, happens to be plasma, and that's the fluid uh, component, and that's going to be made up mostly of water. Then we have our proteins and other, we're talking about hormone, blood glucose, and our electrolytes. Now we then have our 45%, and it's from 40 to 50, and this is gonna be known as our formed elements. 99% of that is gonna be red blood cells. 1% white blood cells, platelets, where platelets help with blood clotting. So your average person has got around five liters of blood, bigger people, more, smaller people, less. And obviously, we want to have a certain amount of oxygen carrying capacity, which is mostly being carried by our red blood cells. So the fraction of our total amount of blood that happens to be made up of what's known as the formed elements, which is once again, over 99% of that is red blood cells, is known as our hematocrit. So too high of hematocrit, and you've effectively got too much cells and otherwise that your blood is effectively a little too viscous, that can be bad for your health. Whereas on the other side of the coin, if you have too low of hematocrit, this is something like anemia, where you're not going to have anywhere near enough amounts of red blood cells. So you're going to not be able to carry as much oxygen. So kind of back to the elevation example we talked about earlier, your body's going to have to work harder at rest to deliver oxygen to your tissues because it literally can't carry as much blood per beat around yourself. Now, blood itself is going to go and have these fraction chains with time and that your plasma is going to go up when you happen to be really hydrated, you've had a lot of fluid and you're used to being out and you're heat acclimated, you're used to sweating. Whereas on the other side, we can have this decrease by 10% and potentially even more when you happen to go into dehydration because that's where most of the fluid is coming from that we're sweating out is our blood plasma certain amount of interstitial fluid, certain amount of intracellular fluid, but mostly from the blood plasma. And then once again, what the formed elements are. I'm not going to read it to you guys because that is demeaning. Now, red blood cells are interesting. They can't reproduce. This is where we're going to go ahead and produce them in our bone marrow. And remember the hormone erythropoietin really helps with the production. They only live for about 100 in 20 odd days, uh, we're going to destroy a certain amount every single day just from the nature of living life. Bruises are an example. Walking, you get a little bit of mechanical destruction through the bottoms of your feet of your red blood cells. Uh, obviously, ladies, they're on a monthly phlebotomy schedule, depending on obviously how quick, how frequently their visitor shows up. 
and that's another red blood cell loss. So we have to make sure that we're regenerating this pretty darn frequently. And iron is gonna be one of the major components there. There's some vitamins and some other minerals that are important there. Just making sure that we're getting an adequate amounts in our diets. And if an athlete or an individual has a huge amount of blood loss, give them some time. It's gonna take a little bit of time to regenerate what you've lost. Now, hemoglobin itself is gonna be that major protein that's going to carry oxygen. And so each red blood cell is packed with literally millions, almost a trillion of hemoglobin or a quarter, sorry, of a trillion uh, hemoglobin protein molecules or structures inside of those red blood cells. And so because of that, we're going to be able to carry about 20 milliliters of oxygen per just 100 milliliters of blood. And this is a good thing because it turns out we really like to be aerobic animals where we're sending blood flow to our tissues all the time. Now, effectively how much of our blood is plasma compared to how much of it is formed elements is giving us effectively the thickness of our blood. So our blood naturally is going to be more viscous than water. So think about something like maple syrup, uh, molasses, et cetera. Those are very viscous fluids. They move very slowly. So the higher the viscosity, the greater the resistance we're going to have to that blood flow. And so this can occur due to training because it turns out we're going to be building more red blood cells because we're naturally producing more erythropoietin from all the stress of what we're doing. And or if we're living at altitude and we're having to deal with all of those pressures, we also need to make sure we're increasing our plasma volume along with it, the fluid side. Otherwise, if our blood becomes too viscous, it's more resistant to movement, it's harder for our body to pump it. And in certain cases of even healthy athletes using uh, drugs like erythropoietin, testosterone, growth hormone, et cetera, have died of early myocardial infarctions because they effectively had a blood clot that caused them to have a heart attack because their blood happened to be so thick. So we want to have kind of a sweet spot of effectively how viscous our blood is. If it gets to be too viscous, we're going to have an issue. It's very rare to worry about too high viscosity. If anything, it's pretty normal, unfortunately, in a lot of athletic endeavors that are very aerobic in nature to run into anemic athletes because of just not enough iron intake along with, oh gosh, I think it's B6 because you want to avoid pernicious anemia, copper, and of course, the bioavailability, bioavailability of iron is garbage. Uh, it's really low, even in the best of times. So taking in iron while you're also taking in uh, vitamin C helps work synergistically. Fiber, tannins, um, uh, vegetable-based, and then iron oxide and otherwise, they, they're bio, it actually lowers bioavailability and makes it harder to take it in. So, okay, we covered some solid ground. Um, just to pick on the cross country kids for a couple seconds, how many of your teammates do you guys know have had issues with anemia and had to supplement with iron or otherwise because of uh, all of the wonderful mechanical destruction of red blood cells that you have for playing, uh, not playing, yeah, playing the sport of cross country. I guess we'll use that verbiage, even though it's not good. Um, well, you don't play cross country, you run cross country, but uh, yeah, most of us take iron every day. I think I'm, I don't, but I might be one of the only ones who doesn't. And what do they teach you guys about when you should take the iron and what you should take it with? Personally, I haven't learned anything about it. That's why I don't take it. Because <laughs> if I don't know about it, then I'm not just going to take it anytime, you know? Oh, and no worries. Yeah, you take it with vitamin C helps increase it. Uh, ferrous uh, sulfate usually has better bioavailability. Taking it in literally the form of animal heme iron, so just a steak and an orange, doesn't sound like a bad meal to me, but obviously I've got my own stuff. Um, the issue you could have is, uh, funny thing is iron oxide is literally just really well chemically cleaned rust. That's all it is. It's just rust shavings uh, that they then get people to supplement with because they don't know any better, but it's really cheap. So that's the type of iron you see a lot of people taking. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's not unheard of and it's a pretty normal thing for aerobic athletes and high volume aerobic athletes that have impact, AKA people that run, um, have issues with potentially getting into anemia, especially if they're female. And then also if they're eating a diet that naturally avoids uh, you know, red meats, it, specifically people that are vegetarian, it can be a bigger issue just because they don't, they can get in situations where they're just not having as much iron in their diet. 
So that's um, that's a wrap on today, guys. Any questions about expectations for the rest of this week? Figure, obviously, if you see the whole thing for classes uh, are once again going to be online on Friday, we're just going to, I'll turn this on at 125. We can talk. If you guys want to talk, if you guys don't want to talk, you don't have to show. It's just meant to be kind of reviewing information and talking through things since we are effectively ahead of the game of where I'd like to be. But that's also because it's me typically talking to the wall uh, for an hour. And I want you guys to feel like you're understanding, especially since now you guys are starting to see those homework assignments where you got to apply that knowledge and not just look it up in the book because the book doesn't have the answer. You've got to think your way through as to why these things work. So questions, comments, concerns? All right. So without further ado, you guys have yourselves a great day. Stay safe out there. And uh, yeah, see you guys soon, wherever that may be. Bye-bye.